we would like to thank the Mary Greeley Foundation for funding support from a gift from the Hegstrom Sampos, or sorry, from the Hegstrom family to honor the late Dr. George Hegstrom. Um, I would also like to just remind everyone where the bathrooms are. So if you need to get up and uh, use the restrooms, you'll just go out the doors and to the right and then kind of behind the desk by radiology. There are some uh, restrooms there. And I'd also like to remind everyone just to silence your phones, make sure that those are um, quiet for tonight's speakers. And now I'll introduce our first speaker. We have uh, Dr. Ajay Nair. Ajay is an associate professor of horticulture at Iowa State University and an extension vegetable specialist. His lab focuses on developing strategies that enhance crop production, soil health, and cropping system profitability in vegetable cropping systems in Iowa. His lab also engages growers and extension personnel through on-farm research and demonstration trials to enhance sustainability and profitability of vegetable cropping systems. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz, uh, for the wonderful introduction. And since I'm far away from you, I hope it's okay if I remove my mask. Uh, I am vaccinated and, uh, uh, and boosted as well. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, symposium. I just heard and learned about uh, Dr. George Hegstrom of, of what he did and, and his pioneer work in starting the diabetes work here. So, so hats off to him. Uh, and uh, also, I was a little perplexed when I got the email from Liz uh, saying that a call from Mary Greeley. Okay. I said, oh, is everything okay? So, uh, she said, you have to talk about vegetables. I said, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, and then I walked into this room and I see that the, the bar is too high for me, very high, because I have my primary care physician, Dr. Michael Bird here, and he's a vegetarian. <laughs> so I need to do a good job, you know, with my vegetables here today. Uh, otherwise, you know, next visit I go there, it might be might be challenging. Uh, okay, so uh, so with that, I have an hour, and I have I'm 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 sharing this podium with Alice, uh, and I'm sure she's going to share a wonderful work which she does at the farm and talk about nutritional aspects and many other things that. Uh, in the world of uh, fruit and vegetable production. So with that, the garden is calling. You might be wondering, garden is calling and it snowed, but, but that's okay. I think I think we'll be there. So the first thing, first thing first, I want to set it right. We are in an agricultural state, right? So the tractors have the same respect and value as the cars. So uh, uh, I like this picture because you know this was actually not the picture was not taken in Iowa, but at, in Michigan when I went where I went to grad school is that the farm manager came to the department. He didn't find any space and he just parked his car right in that <laughs> in the parking lot. So uh, I, I quickly uh, took that picture. Uh, in today's talk, what I want to focus on is uh, vegetables. And when I talk about vegetables, I want to talk about uh, uh, how to grow them efficiently, how to diagnose some of the issues and, and, and symptoms which you see in your backyards when you grow your vegetables, how to manage soil. I will talk a little bit about some key insect, uh, key insects and diseases uh, that our vegetables get. And uh, hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll have some idea to diagnose few things uh, just based on cursory evaluation uh, and, and observing your plants and how they look like. So uh, uh, that's that's how I uh, tailored my presentation. So first things first, I don't know how many of you uh, are do grow vegetables. Raise your hand. Okay, okay, majority of you. And I'm sure many of you uh, use transplants to grow your vegetables, especially when it comes to tomatoes, peppers, eggplant. Uh, because uh, to begin with, transplants are excellent uh, in vegetable production. They have a lot of benefits when we start from transplants, uniform seed germination. You can start your transplants early. How many of you have started transplants in your basement already? Okay, a few of you with some fluorescent lamps. No, no fluorescent lamps, okay. With some of you fluorescent lamp, one time a grower in Sioux City put the high pressure sodium lamp in their basement and after a few weeks, the police came knocking. <laughs> and they thought that they're growing some other things in their basement, <laughs> but they were growing transplants. There, there, was, there was nothing else. It was a broad leaf and not a grass. <laughs> uh, but anyways, it's good to provide light uh, to your plants because they need it. We are growing transplants at a time when 
outside uh, temperature is not very high, you have cloudy days, so it's good to use lights if you're using growing them in, the, in your basement. So transplants extend growing season because you can start early. But the most important fact of using transplants is that it's, it enhances the growth of the plant, the development of the plant, and it yields higher produce and better quality. So it's, it's highly recommended that crops which you can start from transplants, go ahead with that. Some are not suitable for, uh, to be grown from transplants, for example, radishes. Carrots, onions. Onions, there are some growers who are doing that now, uh, but there are certain crops that don't uh, uh, conform to transplant, but majority of uh, them do. Uh, before I move further, uh, I would like to mention, and I'm, I'm sure Alice will mention this too, that she has brought some plants for you. Uh, and she brought the ideal plants. I think many of those cold crops and cool season crops, uh, which are ready to be planted. And I was thinking way ahead. Uh, I brought you tomato transplants, uh, but you don't plant them out right now. You have to wait for at least two or two and a half, three weeks. But there are some plants behind you. Uh, so once the symposium is over, feel free to grab those plants. Uh, so getting back to transplants. So if you can use transplants, go ahead with that, because that will, that, that will be better for the plant growth and yield. You have to set yourself for success and not failure. Uh, so in this case, I primarily work with commercial growers on, on a little larger scale, and they use plastic mulch to, to suppress weeds and conserve moisture and, and have trickle irrigation. Uh, and these are some cucumber transplants uh, which were planted outside uh, in the month of uh, May. Uh, what do you think is the problem here with these transplants? You can raise your hand, you can shout loud, however. Okay, not enough light. Okay, and because of which what happened is that the transplants grew taller, they became lanky. And so when you plant them outside, and you know how Iowa is when it comes to wind, the plants are battered around. And if you look closely in that picture, uh, this one has snapped already. Uh, so in this case, the transplants were grown in the tray for a longer amount of time. So in the case of cucurbit crops, musk melon, watermelon, cucumber, you don't want to grow your transplants more than three to four weeks. Even four weeks is stretching it. So three weeks is ideal. So if your planting time is end of May, don't start your transplants now because you will end up with long, uh, slender transplants. So uh, what I mean to say is know what duration it takes to grow your transplants and start your seed accordingly and, and plant uh, when, when the time arrives. Uh, one important step uh, which many home gardeners uh, skip or don't think much about is when they buy their transplants from, let's say, Holubs or Earl May or Loaves, uh, they bring the transplants which were outside or in a greenhouse and they immediately plant. So uh, it's, it's okay in some cases, but in most cases, it's better to first harden them off. Just acclimatize them. Uh, you can put them in a, in a shady area where there's no direct sunlight. They get exposed to nighttime low and daytime high. And so if you acclimatize them for four or five days and then you plant, the transplant shock will be minimal. So the establishment will be better and you would not lose that transplant. So it's very important that we harden off our transplants when we get them uh, from, this, uh, from the store. So it, it preconditions them, uh, exposes them to outside temperature, again, exposes them to some of the moisture stress as well. So a key point of hardening them off. Uh, this is how commercial growers would do it. So in this case at the farm, we have a wagon. These are all cucumber transplants. Uh, we put them in a lath house. There's a shade cloth on top of it, and they will sit there for about four or five days, and then we'll transplant. So we minimize the, minimize the uh, effect of uh, a transplant shock. In the case of cucurbit crops, so again, cucumbers, musk melon, watermelon, squash, it is important uh, that uh, we, we don't let the plant just sit there for a time after you transplant. And that happens if you don't acclimatize them. So what happens is if the acclimatization is not proper, the plant is in the soil, sits there four or five days, doesn't grow much, and then it starts growing. And if you're doing it in end of May, uh, you would have noticed, or maybe you, this year you will notice, is everybody knows about cucumber beetles, those yellow colored beetles, yellow and black, that swarm the cucurbit crops. So what we notice is a cucumber beetles are actually sitting on the fence and watching us transplanting. <laughs> and they're like, OK, food is ready. Let's go. So we don't want the plants to have the shock and just sit there and not grow. We would rather have them grow faster because by growth itself, they can keep uh, fend some of these insects uh, away from them. So that's why it's very important that we acclimatize our plants. 
this is an this is a this is a picture and i have a video after this i hope it plays this is from heidelberg germany we took a study abroad course there in 2017 and this was a greenhouse there that was growing transplants of tomatoes and they were trying to acclimatize their transplants by one keeping them short and stout and the way you can see the example here uh, this one here is more stout and, and more condensed plant as compared to this one a bit more longer and the way they were doing that uh, was uh, uh, using let's see if this video plays okay i think it might play was using the air blast so you see that air blast going over the tomato transplants and what it's doing it's just it's giving it that stimulus and then a little small shock every day so that the plant doesn't grow too big and it's more stout and compact and that's what we want when we want to plant transplants outside you can achieve this too you don't need this high input there you can just use your hands and just go over your transplants uh, four to five weeks from seeding just every day once a day just brush them with your hand and that response uh, helps to keep the plants you know uh, stouter uh, and more stronger so so that's something you can do to your to your transplants and if you have any question please feel free to raise your hand i'll, I'll do my best to watch for the questions here in the crowd uh, another advantage of using transplants this is peppers uh, uh, what what the acclimatization process does when we put them outside is that it helps to manage some of those insect pests that are on these transplants peppers are notorious for aphids uh, uh, which you know suck the sap and they and they reduce the uh, the, the the limit the growth of the plant and, and reduce the quality so when you plant when you acclimatize these transplants outside before transplanting uh, these are aphids, for example, uh, just for, for your uh, reference here, you can see those two black holes that are jutting out of the back of the body. Those are called cornicles, and that's how you identify aphids. So if you look closely, uh, this is an aphid, but when we, when we acclimatize the plants outside before transplanting, you have an enemy for aphid out there. And you know what this one is? Anybody? Ladybugs. Yeah, ladybugs are, uh, I mean, their favorite food is aphid. And uh, in this picture, if you look closely, we brought some plants inside and, and looked under the microscope, and that's how I got this picture, is you look at two aphid legs hanging out of the mouth of the, <laughs> right? So the, the ladybug is doing its job, you know? It, it is, it is and, and that one is definitely scared. And again, I can, this one is also in the mouth here, but they eat aphids like in volumes. So it's good to have those ladybugs, those beneficial insects out there to manage some of the pests on, on your plants. Uh, when it comes to transplanting, I'll move over. This is the last slide. Whenever I'm talking about transplanting, is that some are some plants are easy to transplant: uh, broccoli, Brussels sprout, cabbage, tomatoes. Uh, those plants, you know, are, are very strong. You can literally stand and just throw the transplant into the hole. Uh, and some students in my lab have done that. They were like, "Aim." Uh, but you have to be extremely careful when it comes to uh, cucumber and cucurbit crops because they don't like their root systems to be squished, mushed, and pushed inside. So be careful when transplanting cucumber, uh, and that will help to limit that transplant shock. So uh, uh, all the cucurbits, uh, we, we cannot throw them. Uh, we have to gently place them uh, in the holes. Now I'll shift focus to nutrients. And, and just like we all need food, we all need nutrients. Plants also need food. And if, if you, categor if you uh, categorize them into two major categories, uh, we call them as macronutrients. These are nutrients which the plants need in larger amounts, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, and there are some micronutrients. And as the name suggests, the plants don't need them in larger amounts. So uh, commercial growers would apply a micronutrient maybe every five to six years only if there is deficiency in the soil, and they, they, we need very little of it. But when it comes to macronutrients, we have to apply them every year. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that's why we hear NPK. It could be conventional source, it could be organic. So I like this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, quote from, uh, this is the Liebig's Law of Minimum. And if you look at this uh, barrel, imagine the staves of the barrel to be an individual nutrient. Uh, the, the stave, which is the shortest, is the rate governing step. So what it means, so in this barrel for the water to be in there, this is the stave, which will govern how much water will be there. You might have all other nutrients in the soil in the optimum range, but if one nutrient was less, you are not allowing that plant to grow to its fullest potential. So that's why it's very important 
that we know what is in our soil, how much of N is there, how much P, how much K, so that you can make sure that all the staves are at the top and not one is reducing the uh, uh, the uh, uh, production potential uh, for your vegetable. So that's this is the Liebig's law of, uh, of minimum. Uh, availability of soil nutrients. Uh, oftentimes we see that uh, many of those nutrients in Iowa soils, we are blessed. We have amazing soils here, high organic matter. Uh, but at the same time, you know, plants have a high demand for these micronutrients. And oftentimes what happens is all the nutrients are in the soil. It's just that the plant is not able to take it in. And that is uh, dependent on the pH of the soil. Just like, you know, you have pH for blood and other milk and other, other uh, things. There is pH for soil also. And uh, uh, we try to make sure that the soil pH is between 6 and 7. That's the ideal pH between six and seven, because if that's there, all the nutrients will be available to the plant. Uh, if not, you might have an element which is there, a nutrient there in large amounts, but it's not available because the pH is not correct. Six to seven, that, that's the optimum pH for uh, vegetable production. So I superimposed uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the pH here, 4.5 to eight, and uh, I put some of the nutrients on, on, on this chart. So you can see that between that six to seven pH, most of the nutrients, nitrates, potassium, phosphate, magnesium, sulfur, most of them, not all, are available to the plant. Uh, in Iowa, especially the uh, western side of Iowa, Council Bluffs, uh, we have soils which are high in uh, pH. The pH is high, inherently high. And in those cases, we see deficiency symptoms. So if you look at, especially for iron, so if you look at it, you are here on this side, and uh, this is the high pH area, and iron is available in low pH soils. So oftentimes, when we see that, we, we get the soil sample, we see the plant, nutri plant uh, symptoms, we ask, what's the soil pH? And if we know the pH is high, you don't have to add iron to make it available. You just reduce the pH and bring it to six and seven. So it's not always about adding nutrients. It's about managing the soil, managing the soil pH. Uh, I brought two publications here. One is managing the soil in your backyard. So that will be helpful and give you some of these, some of the idea of what are the things we need to be focusing on. And another one is on drip irrigation, just an overview of what drip irrigation is. But the managing the soil publication, uh, um, my predecessor, Dr. Hank Tabor, worked on it uh, and still has very relevant information. So soil pH, six to six and seven. Uh, in this case, I superimpose all the vegetables on the on the pH chart, and you can see most of the vegetables grow well in that six to seven. Uh, asparagus, beets, cabbage, muskmelon, you name it. Uh, potatoes are a little bit more benign. They, they are okay. Same thing with asparagus. They don't mind a wider fluctuation of soil pH. Anybody knows why asparagus would be, I'm fine if the pH is not okay. High pH, I'm still okay. Why asparagus? Okay, I'll give you a hint. What about the root system of asparagus? How deep in the soil? Very deep, right? Vegetables, tomatoes, peppers, average rooting depth is about 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches. Asparagus, you're talking about feet, four feet, five feet, and they can get nutrients from wider ranges. So they are not much affected by the pH in the upper six to 12 inches of soil. So that's why asparagus is okay. In the case of potatoes, uh, they don't mind low pH. And in fact, I would say maybe 15 years, 10, 15 years back, growers in Iowa, especially the muck soils near Mason City, Fertile, that area, and even Southeast Iowa, uh, Muscatine, uh, growers would prefer growing potatoes in low pH soils. And the reason behind that was if you, uh, I, I don't know how many of you have seen, sometime when you, you know, when you're harvesting potatoes in your backyard, you would have seen these uh, reddish sunken spots on your potatoes, like a scab. Uh, it's called potato scab. And it's caused, caused by a pathogen, like a bacteria called Streptomyces scabies. And uh, Streptomyces scabies doesn't grow well in low pH soils. So growers would prefer growing potatoes in low pH soils. But now what has happened is many of the new cultivars of potatoes that are available, Red Norland, Yukon Gold, many of them are scab resistant. So you don't have to worry about lowering the soil pH. You can buy scab resistant potatoes. Uh, but And then there are certain crops that are a little bit more sensitive. You, the onions, lettuce, radishes, 
bit more sensitive for, to soil pH. So the, the single most thing if you take out of this talk is look for your soil pH and make sure that that's it between six and seven. So how do you do that? How would you uh, how how would you do it? So uh, I don't expect you to do what this gentleman is doing that you have to go in and take your soil sample six to uh, you know six feet or five feet in the soil. For most of the vegetable crops, the above six to 12 inches, you know, that's where the, the uh, these uh, nutrients, the dynamic dynamic cycle is, is happening. So if you take uh, a sample six to eight inches deep, and that's what we send for analysis, uh, uh, for soil analysis, and that will give you many different things. Uh, you should be actually doing a test once every year. Commercial growers, we highly recommend that. Homeowners, backyard gardeners, maybe not every year, maybe if every other year, so you know uh, what's in the soil. Uh, and, and we prefer to sample in the fall. And the reason being uh, to change pH, it's not very difficult to change pH. You can easily change soil pH. You would know uh, if you have grown rhododendrons and other crops or, or blueberries, you know that they need lower pH and you need to add peat or elemental sulfur to reduce the soil pH. If you want to increase the soil pH for some other crops, you use lime, uh, calcium carbonate, you can use that. Uh, so, but if you, if you analyze your soil in the fall, then there is time for you to correct the soil pH until next April or May when you're going to plant. It is less, less uh, relevant to adding lime. So if your uh, soil pH was, uh, let's say, 5.5 and you wanted to bring it to 6.5, you can add lime in the spring. It'll, it'll work it in. You work it in a few months. Uh, another, um, uh, I would say about one and a half months, two months, the pH will be rising up there. But that's not the case with uh, reducing the soil pH. So if you want to reduce the soil pH, you add elemental sulfur. And elemental sulfur takes about six to eight months to react in the soil and then bring the pH down. 2012, I was visiting a grower in Kelowna, Iowa, Amish grower, and he showed me soil test results. And we, uh, we looked at it, me and some of my colleagues, and it was like 3.5. And we were like, we, we don't know of any soils in Kelowna that are at 3.5 soil pH. So I, we asked, what happened? So he, he told us, you know, the soil pH was low. And so in the fall, I applied, uh, soil pH was high, 8.5. So we applied elemental sulfur and uh, to bring the soil pH down. I said, great, that's what you should have done. And then he said that I waited for a month and I tested again and it did not bring it down. So I applied more and he applied two or three times of elemental sulfur. And in the six to eight months, starting in May, June, the soil pH is at the 3.5 level. So it takes time for the elemental sulfur to react. So you need to wait for six to eight months. So sampling in the fall helps to correct that. If the pH is high, you can apply elemental sulfur in the fall and by April, May, you should be fine. Uh, six inch step, that, that, that's adequate. You don't have to go deeper than that. Uh, if, if you have a garden where you are specifically dedicating to grow vegetables, uh, maybe a raised bed or, or larger, or, or a, let's say 20 by 20 plot or a 10 by 10 plot, just go there and just took some, take some random samples. That's how you should sample. Randomly sample, make a W in there or make an M in there and take six or seven samples, put it in a, in a five gallon bucket, shake it well, and then scoop maybe a, a, a Ziploc bag, a half a gallon bag of soil. And that's what you send for analysis. You don't have to send all six. You make a composite sample and then you send it out for analysis. When you send it out for analysis, the next question you would ha ask is, where should I send it for analysis? Uh, uh, so we did have a soil testing lab at ISU in the Department of Agronomy, uh, but unfortunately right now that lab is going through some restructuring and they're only focusing on research samples, but there are other labs you can send your soil samples to. You can go online, you can find information. University of Minnesota, they have a wonderful soil testing lab. University of Wisconsin, uh, there are some private labs available, Midwest Laboratories in Omaha, a Lab in Atlantic, Iowa, Minnesota Valley Testing Lab in Nevada, not very far from us. So there are many places you can send samples. It will cost you about $15 to $20 to analyze that soil. But I think that $20 is worth spent because you have the report of your soil, pH, EC, you know, uh, many, many other nutrients. I thought somebody's going to scoop me out of here. The elevator just opened. I'm talking too much. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, what are some things you get in your soil test report? You will get pH. Uh, what's the soil pH is? You might get some lime recommendations. Although we provide it, uh, we provide that recommendation if we get soil samples uh, in the department. Organic matter, cation exchange capacity, phosphorus, nut. I mean, th there's a lot of information, and we can help you interpret that. Uh, but you need to have like a test report for your soil. 
Uh, this is more for commercial purposes, so you don't have to pay much attention. Uh, but when you we provide recommendations based on what is in the soil. So, for example, phosphorus. If the soil test comes back with 20 to 30 parts per million, it is in the medium to high range. And we, we ask the grower, what are you going to grow? Tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, sweet corn, and we provide recommendations accordingly. It, it, it's no, uh, we, we, it's, uh, it's not like a set rate for every crop. We have to go by the crop uh, um, to decide how much to apply. Uh, in Iowa, most of the soils are uh, that we get uh, or I see analysis for are very high in phosphorus, very high in phosphorus. So anything 40 ppm, this is in parts per million, 40 ppm or 50 ppm and higher is high. You don't have to apply phosphorus. We have seen set test results with 500 ppm, 400 ppm because of constant use of phosphorus fertilizer, also constant use of compost because compost brings in a lot of phosphorus with it and you apply a higher amount of compost every year, you will accumulate phosphorus. Again, large applications, I'm talking about like 10 tons to an acre, 20 tons to an acre. In small backyard gardens, we don't see that uh, issue. So, uh, let's quickly go through some of the nutrient deficiencies which you might observe this summer when you are uh, in your backyard and how to, you know, how to, how to manage them. So uh, uh, this is a, it's, it's a wonderful dichotomous key uh, from uh, University of Minnesota. I, I see a question there. Yes. Why does it change? Good question. Uh, uh, the question is uh, soil testing every year or two. Why does it change? Uh, a lot of the nutrients which are in the soil at the end of the season, it ends up in your fruits, in your plant, in the root. So the plant is mining all those nutrients. And since these are macronutrients, they take large amounts of it. That's why we need to make sure that we replace. Micronutrients, they do not need much. So you apply every five, six years. But the macronutrients, the plants will take it. So that's why. But good question. So this dichotomous key, uh, uh, University of Minnesota, uh, it's from their website. And what it tells you is when you're out there in your backyard and you see some of these symptoms. So let's let's walk through one. So you walk out there, you see that, you, you see uh, uh, the symptoms of uh, Chlorosis, which means yellowing, is in the lower leaves of your plant, not on the top of the plant, but the bottom portion of the plant, which is the lower leaves or older leaves. Uh, you know that lower leaves, chlorosis, you move there. Uh, uh, next step, you see that that chlorosis is not very really even, rather it is intervenal, like it's you have green veins and yellow between the veins. So now you have kind of diagnosed older leaf, chlorosis, intervenal, you know that it's caused by magnesium. So, so this key helps to kind of guide you through some of the nutrients, not all. In some cases, we have to send it to a testing lab to know. But otherwise, magnesium deficiency, I think we can easily diagnose that. Lower leaves, intervenal chlorosis, more or less chances that it's magnesium. What if, uh, what if it's in the younger leaves, so it, at the top of the plant? Uh, and again, chlorosis, so gen general yellowing. Uh, it could be intervenal, and if that's the case, now you have many contestants or, or many candidates. It could be zinc, it could be manganese, uh, it could be iron or copper. So, so it, it could be a little tricky. But then what I'll do is I look for the soil test result and look for the pH and, and make a make an educated argument from there. Okay, this is the soil pH. These are the, some of the nutrients that could be lacking, and, and this is how we can correct it. So this is a wonderful dichotomous key uh, uh, which you can use. I'm going to see if I can move that. Maybe not. So uh, this is general chlorosis, just to show you in terms of uh, uh, pictures here, uh, tomato transplant, we see yellowing, general yellowing, it's not intervenal or anything. And this is typical, and this is for, uh, in, in the lower leaves, in that case, we know that it's nitrogen. Nitrogen causes, uh, nitrogen causes uh, general yellowing uh, in, the, in, the, in the bottom portion of the plant. Now, nitrogen is an important nutrient, it's a macronutrient, building block of DNA. Uh, important component of chlorophyll. So that's why you see the symptom in the leaves because leaves have chlorophyll. And uh, it's, it's an irony that uh, we are surrounded by nitrogen, right? The earth 79% is nitrogen, but that's the nutrient that's rate limiting in many countries across continents. So uh, uh, we need to provide, uh, uh, provide nitrogen uh, to our plants uh, to grow. So how do you apply nitrogen? And this is a, a general con generalization based on your backyard, your, your vegetable garden. It's a critic. It's critical to apply. You need to apply it. Uh, 
some grow, some of you might be using the general purpose that miracle grow fertilizer. It could be a 10, 10, 10, which is NPK. If you are using that, and I'll talk about compost also, but if you're using this, you know, a, a pound per hundred square feet. So a 10 by 10 plot, you have a pound of that, you spread evenly, incorporate it in. That's a good pre-planned fertilizer uh, before you plant. So this is before you plant. This actually uh, translates out to about 40 pounds per acre. On an acre basis, this is 40 pounds. Typically, tomatoes, peppers, they all need anywhere from 120 to 150 pounds per acre in a growing season. So you applied almost one third of it in the beginning and the remaining you can broadcast as the plant grows. In commercial production, they would send it through drip irrigation and the fertilizer is water soluble and they have weekly applications so we can manage the plant on a, on a week to week basis. But pre-plant, small scale, one pound per hundred square feet, that, that's a good rate to start. Now, if you're using compost, which I highly recommend, uh, uh, to use uh, great uh, organic resource. Uh, it not only adds nutrients, but it brings in many other things. Think about stimulating the biology in the soil. Think about uh, water holding capacity. Think about uh, the uh, porosity. Uh, uh, it's great in, in all sense. It, it cannot be compared with the fertilizer because that's not its only purpose. It does many wonderful things. And depending on the source of the manure or, or the feedstock from which the compost was made, you might you know, get different amounts of nitrogen percentage. So that's why uh, the, nitro the compost alone cannot provide all the nutrients because you can see the percentages are pretty low. Uh, uh, one to two percent, two to three, compare that with urea, which is like 46 percent nitrogen, all immediately available. Compost, it's, that's not the case. But application of compost every year, little by little, helps to condition that soil. Uh, it, it, is, it will definitely benefit the plant. And as a pre-plant, if you want to start compost or just in the beginning, if you want to prep your garden, I would recommend anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds, uh, again, for 100 square feet. So that will that will be a good starting point to use compost. Uh, the reason I, I limit it to 10 to 20 pounds is because not all compost are made equal. Depending on how the compost was made, how long it cured, how long, how many times it was turned, the quality will differ. Uh, we do uh, at the Iowa State University, we have a, a huge, large I, ISU compost facility. If you look at south of campus, of University Boulevard. Uh, we have a wonderful ISU compost facility there, but all the compost they grow is used, uh, they they uh, they create is used in the on campus or for larger purposes for buildings and contractor for contract purposes. Uh, they are not selling it to general public right now, but I've been advocating that we should make it an, a resource for our for our community here for for people who love to use compost and maybe bag them because you can buy compost from loaves and and home depot no nothing wrong with them but again all not all compost are made equal some are good quality some are not good quality uh, issues with the lack of nitrogen so if you don't have enough nitrogen to begin with you know uh, uh, early senescence of older leaves, your plants will become yellow for early. You are losing that potential of that plant to produce the crop. So that's why nutrients are important. We need to apply a poor yield and quality and, and lack of productivity. Issues with too much nitrogen. And this also happens. You know, we, we flood the system with so much of nitrogen that the plants put too much of vegetative growth. So then that will compromise the amount of fruits which the plants would produce. Uh, delayed maturity in crops, uh, low sugar content. Um, uh, lower acidity and, and reduce firmness. So those are some of the side effects or, or the ba uh, ill effects of adding too much nitrogen. Uh, increase in disease pressure when you add too much nitrogen, too much green and aphids, thrips, you know, caterpillars, they're all attracted to, to that plant. Uh, in cabbage, for example, the head would crack, the cabbage head would crack if there's too much of nitrogen. So this is a picture from the greenhouses. This semester, this cabbage was grown there, a part of a student class, which I teach on vegetable production. And the students put too much nitrogen. And you can see that, that the head is cracking. Uh, the head is just opening from the center. So uh, this is what happens if you apply too much nitrogen to cabbage. Uh, broccoli, uh, too much nitrogen can also cause this. I don't know how many of have you noticed this. This is a couple of years back. I brought a broccoli and I cut it open and I saw this big channel in there. Uh, and so this is the uh, uh, internal cavity that, that forms in broccoli because of too much nitrogen. There are many other factors also that can cause it. Uh, less boron in the soil can cause that head 
uh, internal uh, 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 you know hollow head hollow head is that's what we call too much nitrogen warm temperatures wide spacing the plants are spaced too wide apart you can see that internal hollow and some varieties are more susceptible uh, but what i want to bring uh, forth here is not too much nitrogen is good we need to be in that optimal uh, range <clears throat> <clears throat> next is phosphorus uh, important nutrient again part of the dna uh, a macronutrient part of adp atp those uh, energy uh, molecules uh, purpling is what we see when you have uh, lack of phosphorus so an easy way to remember is p for purpling and p for phosphorus and you always see that in the lower leaves this is a tomato plant here which is showing uh, phosphorus deficiency this is a corn plant sweet corn that is showing phosphorus deficiency so that's how you identify that I want to mention this too. Uh, sometimes when you plant your tomatoes out there, there might be enough tomatoes, uh, phosphorus in the soil, but just because it, the soil was cold, you will see some purpling because phosphorus doesn't move in cold soils. So you don't have to go and jump and add phosphorus to that soil. In a week or two, you will see that the purple will go away. So sometimes cold soils also uh, cause uh, uh, purpling. Next is potassium. Uh, it's an important nutrient for fruit production. Think about Tomatoes, peppers, they're all fruit, cucumbers. Uh, it's important for transpiration, for the opening and closing of the stomata, and it increases leaf uh, chlorophyll content. I'll show you some pictures uh, that will explain uh, things better. How many times have you harvested tomatoes which did not ripen evenly? They have either a green shoulder or a yellow shoulder. <clears throat> this is caused by uh, potassium deficiency. This is called yellow or green shoulder uh, disorder. So if you're seeing this again and again in your backyard in your garden plots i suspect it's potassium uh, because that's a classic symptom of potassium deficiency more pictures uh, same thing yellow shoulder disorder the fruit doesn't ripen evenly and by adding potassium you can easily take care of this issue uh, it's a physiological disorder heat can also cause it uh, although less chances but heat can cause it uh, and again, potassium is needed for uniform color development. So that's where that soil testing early in the season is, is critical. Uh, in, cu in cucumbers, this is how the potassium deficiency shows up. The edges of the leaf will, be, will become necrotic or they will be dying, uh, papery, crinkly, uh, really dry and brown. This is potassium deficiency on the edges of the leaf. That's how it shows up. Uh, and, and this is more maybe for the nerds out here who really want to know what's happening with these nutrients why are they not collaborating with each other it's because of this chart uh, this is called the mulder's chart and this chart tells you which nutrient help each other and which don't so the antagonism and synergism uh, between nutrients so you can see this here if you see a green line between nutrients okay potassium potassium and iron are are synergistic but you see more red lines so a higher concentration of one nutrient will limit the absorption of the other into the plant. So that's why we want to be in that optimal range. Uh, these nutrients fight with each other to get inside the plant. Uh, so uh, this is a good resource just for you to put it out there in your cocktail parties in your house. Somebody comes, hey, by the way, do you know Mulder's chart? What is Mulder's chart? So uh, and if you look at this, you know, imagine this door to be the plant root and, and all the nutrients want to get in through that root. And in this case, you know, if, if potassium is less, not optimal, calcium and magnesium, they hog the space. They have just gone into the plant. Uh, potassium, you can, you can get many different resources. This is more for commercial purposes, but potassium sulfate is something which is very easily available through co-ops across Iowa. You can buy specific potassium fertilizers at, at uh, Home Depot and, and Loaves also. Uh, but potassium is an easy to fix thing. You can apply right in the beginning before you plant and it'll take care of uh, uh, the deficiency. And you can see you don't need a lot of potassium. Uh, depending on the range of what you have in the soil, you need very little amount, one and a half pound, one pound uh, for, for 100 square feet. So not a lot of potassium needed uh, to make sure that you don't see that symptom later on when the fruits are ready to be harvested, because that's the time when the loss has already happened. I'll quickly go through calcium. This is a highly immobile element and the deficiency shows on the younger leaves because it's not mobile in the plant. So it shows up in the, in the younger leaves. It's important for cell division, protein synthesis, many things. And this is something which is very common across, across backyard gardening, even for commercial purposes. Growers would see this. The blossom end of the tomato is rotting. 
And this is called the uh, uh, blossom end rot. And it's caused by two things. One is calcium and two is irrigation, improper irrigation. If you're watering your plants in like 10 day period, that's too much of a gap. You need to water your plants every three to four days. You have to take into consideration the rainfall, obviously, but you want to have a steady flow of moisture because calcium moves into the plant with water. So if you are watering today and then you water after 10 days, the plant has gone through that stress for, potass for calcium and you will see more blossom and rot. And the way it shows up is like this. So initially it will show up like a small spot. If you see your second harvest or the third harvest is showing this black spot, you immediately know that this is blossom and rot. And you need to either manage calcium, hope there is enough calcium in the soil, the pH is correct, or, or just alter your irrigation. Just make sure you water appropriately at the right interval, three to four days, steady flow, and you will take care of it. You, will, you won't see blossom and rot after that. You see more of blossom and rot in uh, container plants, larger containers if you're growing tomatoes in there, because in those containers, you might be using the soil-less mix, the potting mix. And the potting mix doesn't have soil. It doesn't hold moisture that well. So that dries very quickly. So what, what we suggest is if you're using, if you're growing tomatoes in, in a container, maybe 75% of it could be the potting mix. You know, what you, Miracle Grow, whatever other brands are also there, Fafford Mix, there are many brands out there. But maybe mix 25% of your garden soil in it so that the soil will help to hold moisture and limit the occurrence of uh, blossom and rot. This is how blossom and rot looks like in peppers. Again, at the blossom end, it starts at a small black thing here. And if it's more severe, you see more losses uh, because of this. Uh, this is not blossom and rot. Uh, this, in case of peppers, is actually uh, sun scald. The sun was too intense. Maybe the foliage was not covering the plant that well. And you see this area uh, more closely. Uh, you know, that's just becoming light colored, pale colored, and just decaying. By the way, this pepper. Uh, you will love the name of it. It's called tequila. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great pepper, colored pepper to grow. It colors the first thing of all the colored peppers, red, yellow, orange. This will be the one that colors first. But the, but the issue with this is these are smaller fruits. Uh, but if you're growing uh, uh, and, and you want colored peppers early in the season, you know, tequila is the, is the way to go. Uh, calcium has other issues. This is lettuce. So many of you might be transplanting lettuce pretty soon or already have. Uh, uh, this lettuce leaf uh, tip burn. Again, younger growth, uh, like young parts, uh, and you see the leaf tip burn, which is caused by calcium. So if you manage irrigation, you can, you can get out of it. Again, just watering instead of like this, you would rather water like a smooth uh, curve, not too many troughs and, and hills up there, but maybe more uniform. Uh, this is from my colleague, uh, Dr. Lewis Jett. Uh, he's at West Virginia University now, but Lewis came up with this chart and uh, it's a good uh, you know, rule of thumb kind of an approach of how much plant water does a tomato plant need? And so what he did, is, this is from weeks after transplanting on this x-axis and on the y-axis you see water needed in ounces per plant. So you can see the water requirement of the plant goes up eight, eight week, nine week after uh, transplanting and about 75 ounces. Uh, a day. That's what the requirement of that uh, of that plant is. So a rough idea to make sure that you are applying the right amount. Uh, 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 irrigation also has uh, 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 repercussions on 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 blossom. Sometimes you will see that your blossoms are forming and they just fall. They are not staying there, and that could be due to heat, but it also could be due to irrigation if you are not watering uh, properly. Misshapen fruits, you know, cracking. Um, and that is not under your control. You have your tomatoes out there. You have a heavy rain for many days. A day, a day two later, you'll see that your tomatoes are cracking. That's because the plant has taken a lot of water and the fruit is not able to hold it in. And, and you see cracking because of that. Uh, this is a good example to show you magnesium. This is at the horticulture research station here in Ames, part of the Department of Horticulture. And uh, these are peppers we planted in 2017. And what do you see in here? These are all same types of peppers. Yellowing, right? I mean, we were there out there, you know, me and my grad student, we were like, oh, what is happening here? I see all these peppers on the edges, green, green, but this is yellow. Why is this yellow? And we went clo we close to look at it. We saw older leaves, intervenal chlorosis. We tested the tissue, we tested the soil, uh, magnesium. 
it was magnesium deficiency. We knew that going uh, just looking at these pictures. Uh, but these are some ways you can diagnose. But then getting a little bit more into it, and this this brings uh, this emphasizes to know what the history of the plot was where you're growing. So uh, in this picture, uh, these are some high tunnels we constructed in 2017. Before that, in 2016, wherever this row is and this more high tunnels here, three of them actually, that also showed that yellowing. You can see that in this. Wherever you see yellowing, we had apple trees. So then we connected, okay, apple trees for like maybe 20, 25 years. And what that, and we, when we took that apple tree off in 2016 and 2017, in those places, we tilled everything and we planted our uh, peppers. Those apple trees, those roots have mined all the magnesium from that area where the apple tree was growing. So only where the apple trees were, we were observing magnesium deficiency. Uh, so it's always good to connect things and look at the history so you can get a better answer and diagnose things uh, in, in the right way. Uh, so not very difficult to correct magnesium deficiency. Epsom salt, magnesium sulfate, you can spray foliarly, you can send it through the drip irrigation, and that will adjust that. And uh, after a week or two, the plants came back, came out of it. Uh, micronutrients, uh, I'll, I'll quickly talk about only few because Plants don't need this in, in larger amounts. There are several micronutrients listed here. Uh, if you're really interested in micronutrients, we have a publication on the extension uh, store. This is free to download uh, that talks about micronutrients and how plants need it and what amount they need. They don't need a lot. But I'll just focus on boron because we see some of these deficiencies in the, in the field uh, with growers. Uh, this hollow stem uh, we talked about in broccoli and cauliflower, that, that's caused by boron. Sometimes the leaf uh, blotchy ripening in tomatoes can be attributed to uh, a boron. Uh, so just to be aware of, but uh, coal crops, the so coal crops are, cucurbit, uh, are uh, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, um, brassicaceae family, uh, they show uh, boron deficiency very quickly. So if somebody is growing on larger scale uh, crops, uh, they need to be uh, careful. So again, same picture here of how it looks like. You can easily correct it. I will. I will not spend much time here. Iron deficiency. Uh, you see that in in younger leaves, and this is what the iron chlorosis looks like. High pH soils. That's where you see uh, most often iron chlorosis. Sometimes you see the symptom uh, because of drift of glyphosate, our most popular herbicide, right? A Roundup. So sometimes if the Roundup drift happens, the leaves will show the symptom. This is also a uh, classic to Roundup. Uh, this type of uh, symptom, the veins like more close to the midrib of the leaf show yellowing. You can correct iron deficiency, but then I want to quickly switch to some of the common insects and disease uh, and then uh, leave time for, for more questions. Uh, how about this person here, right? I mean, you are looking and looking and looking and you're not able to figure out why, where is the leaf gone from your tomato plant? In, in like two days, somebody has stripped it. So if you look closely, you see this tomato hornworm. There's one more right behind it, and they are voracious feeders. Uh, if you have few plants, like three or four, I would just say go and just pull them off. And if you have chickens, you can feed them to chickens. Although sometimes chickens don't like eating them, uh, uh, but I mean you can either you know crush them, not around with the kids. My daughter doesn't like it when I do that, but then I have to tell her the life cycle and the importance of pest and disease and crop. Uh, but anyway. Tomato hornworm, uh, this is an Im important pest uh, uh, for uh, uh, tomatoes and potatoes, uh, and they will just take your, strip your plant down. You don't need to apply any synthetic insecticide to control it. We have this uh, uh, organic insecticide called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, they come under different names, Dipel, Javelin, uh, but look for BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's an organic, it's a bacterium that is found in the soil, and you spray that on the plant and uh, uh, these caterpillars consume it, and it just stops their internal uh, metabolism. They stop feeding. There are crystals that are formed inside their body, and they just they just die within a few days. So they can be easily organically managed. If you have a lot, many many more plants and you don't want to go and pick, you can spray dipole. Uh, I would say two sprays, uh, three day interval, and that will take care of uh, these hornworms. Uh, the, the way to identify these hornworms, you can see the horn at the back. Uh, sometimes these horns are red in color, not always black. So in this case, you see uh, uh, black. Uh, this is actually a tomato hornworm. If it was red, we call them tobacco hornworm. 
Uh, so there are two different hornworms. Easy way to remember is tobacco. If you smoke, uh, I hope you don't, but if you do, uh, uh, red color, fire, right? Red, red color, and that's how you can identify if you have a red tail or a horn at the back, it's the tobacco hornworm. Quickly switching to some other pests on broccoli and cabbage and other crops which you grow. Uh, the two major pests here are the imported cabbage worm. These are those beautiful, pretty white butterfly which fly with two black dots on their back. If you see them, that's not a good sign. It means that the imported cabbage worm is there and you see holes on your leaves. Uh, you, can, you can spray dipel again. BT will control them because these are caterpillars. Uh, the other pest is the cabbage looper. Just as the name suggests, they loop and move forward. This is the caterpillar of the cabbage looper with black head. This is the caterpillar for the imported cabbage worm. Their head is translucent. It's not black, so for you to identify. But if you see this butterfly flying around with these two black spots at the back, uh, th that's the imported cabbage worm. We don't have issues with the diamond back moth here in Iowa, more, more in the western uh, part of the country. Cucumber beetles, you know, big problem because they they consume the leaves, they damage the leaf, the stem, they even damage the fruit. They they have, you know, you see this honey like sticky material on your cucumber fruit. That's because of cucumber beetle. Uh, there are two types: spotted and and striped. Uh, spotted comes from the south through you know uh, jet uh, uh, winds. The winds carry them from the south, but the Striped one overwinters here in Iowa, so we can't do anything. They are here in Iowa. Uh, they they damage the fruit, as I mentioned, and plant, but they also bring this disease called the bacterial wilt. So if you have seen your cucumber plants doing well one day, next day you go, you see that one of the wine is just droopy. The rest of the plant is okay. Just one of the wine is droopy. In this case, you can see that. This wine here is kind of droopy, but the plant here is perfect, looks great. This is uh, caused by bacterial wilt. The bacteria has gone and plugged the xylem uh, the, where the water flows inside the plant. And because of that, the water is not coming into the plant, it's drooping and eventually this plant will die. The best thing is to rogue the plant, take it out. It's, it's hard to do because if you have only two plants, what do you do? Uh, but if you don't, then the cucumber beetles will take the bacteria from one and put it into the other plant. So we, we highly recommend to manage the beetles to manage the bacteria. Uh, that's the best way to manage uh, bacteria, bacterial wilt. Squash wine border, these are those clear wing moth, uh, uh, metallic orange in color. So if you see them, uh, they lay the eggs right near the base of their squash plant, right on the stem, on the leaf, uh, and they bore into the plant. And once they bore into the plant, it's very difficult to manage them. You can't spray them. Uh, they're inside the plant. Uh, uh, another pest is the squash bug. You might see, have seen these gray colored bugs walking around big numbers they they the eggs are laid in cluster of like 12 16 eggs under the leaf so if you flip your squash leaf and you see this cluster of eggs quickly remove those eggs scrape them off that's the squash bug eggs and uh, these these nymphs when they come out they cause big damage suck the sap they, they reduce the quality they they don't let the plant grow that that well so squash bugs also are are, are endemic i mean they are here in iowa uh, just show you some more pictures. Uh, you can use insecticides over the counter, Bloves or uh, Menards. Uh, they will all, uh, uh, Home Depot will carry insecticides that manage them. Uh, I'm not on the bandwagon of applying too much insecticide. In commercial production, sometimes we have to, to save the crop. Uh, uh, but the main important thing is scouting, just going out and looking around and making sure that your plant is healthy to begin with, with all the nutrients. So it can take some of the damage uh, from some of these pests. Quickly, uh, the importance of few other uh, 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 insects in our in our backyard. Marketable cucumber to your right, and non-marketable on the left. And uh, uh, anybody wants to take a guess of who? Why is this non? Why, why do plants produce some of the cucumbers like this, like a C-shaped or improper shape? You can see this was like a it just tapered at the bottom. Any guess? why the plant is producing this? Uh, it, it's because of improper pollination. So there were not enough bees, there were not enough beneficial insects out there that can do a good job with pollination. So if the pollination was poor, you will see many non-marketable fruits. So the best way is to add maybe some flowers, which I hope you have in your backyard and in your neighbors and neighborhood. That way, you know, you have beneficial insects out there to 
to to make pollination work not just pollination but like 100% pollination uh, because a bee has to visit several times to a flower uh, to 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 uh, get effective pollination done so uh, have plants have beneficial have a uh, uh, habitat plants where these insects, these beneficials can hang on and, and provide you that ecosystem service of pollinating your cucurbits. Uh, one disease which I want to mention, there are many diseases out there, one for cucurbits, uh, one for the cold crops and one for cucumber, uh, for tomatoes, and I'll stop, is this black rot. If you have grown cauliflower, or cabbage, and you have seen that your leaves have this V-colored lesion on the edge of the leaf, it's caused by a bacteria, xanthomonas. And it's in the soil for a very long time. So the best way to get out of this is to rotate. Don't plant the same crop and, and crops from the same families in the same spot. Just move to a different spot. And if you do that, you will eliminate uh, black rot. But black rot is notorious. You have to rotate of that plot at least three to four years to get out of that. So don't plant any coal crops, any brassica, plant some other things, and that will take care of it. Uh, but this is important. And then finally, uh, tomatoes. Many of us grow tomatoes, love to grow tomatoes. How many times, like in July, August, you notice that, why is the bottom of my tomato plant slowly becoming yellow and then brown and dying off? And that's because of the early blight, this disease called tomato early blight. It's a fungus, alternaria. Uh, it is in the soil. When rain comes, splash happens, soil comes onto the plant, and the plant you know, has that, gets that disease. So the best way to manage this is mulch. You know, any kind of mulch, wood mulch, uh, that will reduce the amount of splashing of the soil onto the plant, will eliminate early, early blight. And rotation. Don't grow your tomatoes and peppers and potatoes in the same spot every year. Uh, another, another quick disease is septoria blight. So it, it's a fungus. Same way, it's a, uh, it uh, comes from the soil, so mulching would help. If you mulch, you, uh, you can eliminate this. And finally, uh, the, the last thing I want to mention is rotation. Don't grow the same crop in the same location. And an easy way to do it is, let's say, if you have six beds, small beds, maybe you have only four, that's fine. But year one, just put what, what you put in there. And year two, and the easy way to create a rotation plan is in year two, just take your uh, uh, plant, the crop that was in bed six, and put it in bed one. And move the bed one to bed two, just move one in. And if you keep doing it year after year, just keep one in, moving in, that way you have created a crop rotation plan here by yourself. So it's a six year rotation where you have tomatoes here in that particular area this year, next year there's carrot, then you have peas, then you have cauliflower, and maybe after this you can go back to tomato. Uh, so just put it in a piece of paper, what you put, which place, that way you can create a good rotation plan. It's, it's important. Uh, sometimes we just keep planting the same crop, same place, and we see that the yield goes down, quality goes down, diseases are, soil bond diseases are more, so rotation will take care of that. So finally, uh, many of the pictures I showed you are from projects uh, uh, which I have undertaken at the research station, working with many uh, on-farm uh, grower collaborators and organizations that support our work at Iowa State, many of these funding agencies, USDA, uh, uh, Institute, Institute, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, NIFA, North Central SARE, which is Sustainable Ag Research and Education, uh, Leopold Center, Practical Farmers of Iowa, Iowa Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. I mean, growers like Alice, you know, who might call me and say, hey, I have this problem. What is happening? So that gives us information. Okay, this Alice saw this. So maybe that's a good information we can share with others. And what I found other places I can share with her. So it's a good network, ISU extension and outreach. And we are, we are thankful to all our funding agencies who help uh, uh, us do all that work. And it's not all work work. There is fun also in my lab, just to show you. This is in Muscatine. A few years back, these are some grad students. We had a project focusing on cabbage. And this was a cabbage harvest. We all finished it. Uh, and then one of the students came up with this idea. Let's do a test. Let's do a game. Let's see who puts their cabbage on their head for the longest amount of time. And whoever drops the cabbage will take the picture. So you know who's missing in the picture. <laughs> right? So I lost very early in the in the game. But some of the other grad students, this is Dana Jokla. He did. He means business. And he won, actually. He kept the cabbage on his head for the longest amount of time. 
So with that, you know, uh, this is a website. Uh, if you have questions, uh, uh, this is again mostly for commercial growers because that's how that's who I cater to. But we have a, 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 a consumer horticulture person too in the department, Aaron Style, S T E I L. You can reach out to Aaron. This is my website where we put research reports and YouTube videos of how to determine if your musk melon is ready to harvest. What is this weed? How do you till uh, a crop with minimal damage? Or, or so we we put those short videos out there uh, for the general public uh, if they if they want that information. Uh, but with that, I'm I will open it up for questions uh, and happy to take any questions you have. Oh, okay, okay, sure. I see a question back there. Uh, good question. The question is about Epsom salt. Uh, this is magnesium sulfate. Uh, the question was how, when, and how often. Uh, we, uh, and I think I have a recommendation back there, it's two ounces uh, per gallon. Uh, and you would go and spray on top of the plant. You know, that will be, that will be a quick remedy uh, 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 to correct that deficiency. But we try to do it both foliar spray and through the drip irrigation because we want the the nutrient to be in the soil. Uh, next year, you know what we would do. This was because the plants were in there. If I was going to grow crops again there, I would apply magnesium uh, in in the pre-plant phase itself, so that there is enough magnesium in the soil. Other questions or or, or feedback? Uh, you want to share with anybody here of the crops or, or the vegetable you grew or something unique you want to share? You're growing this year, so feel free. Brussels sprout, anybody growing Brussels sprout? Some of who, who likes Brussels sprout? Many of you. And, and to tell you, uh, there was a survey done in Southern United States. So you know what the reason for the popularity of Brussels sprout in United States is? Why suddenly in last 10 years or five years, Brussels sprout, everybody loves Brussels sprout. The answer is bacon. <laughs> you are correct. I, I, I have never had anybody answer it correctly. It is bacon. So, so what, what has happened is Brussels sprout in restaurants is always served with bacon. And once people get the taste of the bacon and the Brussels sprout, they call, they call themselves, the, oh, I love Brussels sprout. Oh, it's, it's great. Vitamin C, yes, through the roof. But it's the bacon which is making them. So that is the answer. So in the South, when a survey was done, that's what was found that because Brussels sprout is being more served with bacon, People are, are, are because by itself, maybe not much of an appetite, but it's great to grill even without bacon. You can cut into half, put some olive oil, some uh, spice, throw some spices and just put in the oven 40, 50 minutes later. It's 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 delicious. <laughs> and in Iowa, you know, because we it's good to have some frost in the fall because what, these Brussels sprout can take low temperatures, 25 degree Fahrenheit, 24 degree Fahrenheit. No problem. They're totally fine. So in the fall, uh, you need you want the Brussels sprout to get some frost because that adds to the sweetness. And that's why sometimes when we buy Brussels sprout from the store early in the season, they are not sweet. They're very bland uh, because they haven't got, gotten that frost. So locally grown, maybe Alice can grow it for us. Uh, locally grown Brussels sprout are, are way more tastier uh, uh, than, than uh, na grown nationally or got from other places. How, uh, how should it be? Uh, growing, growing uh, over. Basically, I have uh, onions from last fall, and I never, never dug. Okay. Uh, are they going to produce this this season? Yeah. Uh, the question is, the onions that were not dug last fall, are they going to produce this season? Uh, they will be moving to the reproductive phase, so you will not have much of a bulb. Uh, in there, the quality will be poor. Uh, you can harvest it earlier in the season. Don't wait too long, uh, but the, the flavor profile is already lost. Uh, in the case of onions, uh, there are two types, uh, three types of onions. There's a northern type uh, onion, there's an intermediate day length onion, and there's a short day onion. So long day, intermediate, and short day. In Iowa, northern tier climates, we should always grow the uh, long day uh, onion because long day onions, what it means is that uh, the onion plant has to meet the light requirement uh, longer day, which we have here, and 
only once they get that long day requirement, they start to form the bulb. Uh, if you plant a short day onion in Iowa, their growth requirement is met very quickly because we have long days here and they start to bulb very quickly. And so those bulbs will be small uh, and not as big. So in Iowa, we should always grow long duration onions. Uh, some onions can be, uh, most, most onions nowadays are planted using transplants. You have your seed, just like your tomato transplant, six to eight week old, you can, uh, but sometimes you can buy sets. Sets are these onions which you buy from, you can see that at Earl May, Menards, you'll buy sets, uh, which are already small onions. You can plant sets also. This is the time to do that. Uh, when you're planting sets, don't plant sets that are uh, uh, too big. Uh, so if you look at the size of, a, and any set which is less than the size of a nickel, that's ideal. If it's bigger, uh, it is going to bolt. It's going to go to flowering phase. And again, it will not produce those big bulbs. So I gave a very long answer to many different things, but uh, uh, <laughs> I hope it was helpful. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for the patient here. All right, thank you, Ajay. Um, we actually have two more speakers tonight, and they are going to um, be doing their uh, talk together. We have Alice McGarry and Amy Miller. Alice is a farmer, fiddler, potter, fiber artist, and community facilitator. Alice helped to uh, found the Mustard Seed Community Farm in 2008 and continues to work for more, a more loving, just, ecological, and joyful food system. Amy Miller is a professional health coach and wellness advocate. She has been a volunteer with Mustard Seed Community Farm for more than six years, inspired by the farm's approach to sustainable agriculture, community involvement, and compassionate generosity. Amy and her husband Clay also raise fruits, nuts, vegetables on their home farmstead following a permaculture design for natural, integrative, and regenerative food production. So um, thank you, Alice and Amy. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thanks for coming. We're going to we're going to try to do this shared presentation. So um, let us know if you if we're not using the mic properly, I guess uh, I'm going to keep my mask on, but Amy's got hers off. So her face might be more fun, but I'll try to like <laughs> move my eyes, maybe. Your arms. <laughs> um, yeah, we just got we just got this great introduction. Oh, oh our, our slide. Here. Ooh, how do we do the slides? Yeah, we should be working to get them on. I'll okay. okay. Oh, Sarah's gonna check on it. Let's try. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so Amy and I have been working together for six years. Um, I've been part of the Mustard Seed Community Farm for 15 years. Um, and um, we are kind of a crazy farm, uh, kind of a wonderful farm. We are a volunteer farm where a lot of people come together to grow food, to learn how to grow food and to share food. Um, we're going to give you a, a little talk tonight. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're absolutely. So, oh, yep, here we are. So, I'm wondering, is that okay? So, we'll go down. We can use the arrow. Okay. I guess. So, at Mustard Seed Farm, so this is a quote by one of our volunteers. Um, we believe that everyone deserves really good food, and without complete nutrition, it's hard to function at our full human potential. We believe that a great diet allows people to be more healthy, happy, and able to participate with great enthusiasm, generosity, and creativity in our community and world. What we're going to talk about today is the benefits of growing, cooking, eating, and sharing local foods. So why would you want to go through that process of growing your own food. It sounded a little complicated. Um, <laughs> it's not always that complicated, but there are so many benefits. And maybe not everything that we talk about here today is gonna be something that you go home and wanna try to do, but I'm guessing there's gonna be at least one thing that's gonna stick with you. And we're hoping that you'll be inspired. We're kind of wanting to be your cheerleaders and um, plugging yourself in somewhere here in the growing, cooking, eating, or sharing local foods. 
And we also are going to talk about greens and how greens are great. Um, they are an, maybe an underappreciated uh, vegetable, but very easy to grow, very easy to eat, very nutritious. Um, and just that, like, so some of you might do all these things already. You might, you might have a great garden, you might eat lots of vegetables, and maybe we might inspire you to, um, to maybe invite some more people along to kind of think more about community or um, the sharing aspect. Or um, some of you might be wishing you, were, you could do these things, but really maybe feeling um, held back by something. And maybe it's like we don't have a place to grow a garden, or you don't know where to start, or um, or eating fresh vegetables is um, feels like it's out of your price range. Um, so just um, we're also wanting to encourage you to kind of think outside of the box, and that um, some of these things are easier more possible and more fun. Especially with a buddy. Especially with a buddy. So <laughs> that's that's what we're kind of yeah here to encourage you that if it's if it's feeling too hard, look for a buddy. Absolutely. So um our farm we share a lot of food with a lot of people. It's part of our main mission and um, we're also part of the Story County Hunger Collaboration. So I um, just wanted to kind of start off talking a little bit about food insecurity in our county and um, also our world. But um, some folks, you know, we've all been going through a hard time this past couple of years. We've been going through a pandemic. Um, I think people might be suffering. We, you know, we've all suffered from loneliness, from isolation, um, some economic str struggles, um, supply chain issues, now inflation. Um, oftentimes when we are struggling economically, fruit and vegetables are the first things to go. Um, they are often more expensive. And um, if you're just thinking about feeding your family, you might be thinking, I could get more calories or less money if I, if I buy less vegetables. Um, and so, but they, they really, they are really important. So, um, so we just are sharing some things here about food insecurity. Um, Story County is one of the most food insecure um, counties in Iowa. And I think sometimes we don't realize that there are a lot of people who are struggling to access um, enough food for their families. And definitely there are a lot more people who are struggling to access enough healthy food for their families um, because that is more expensive. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, just, we believe that having good food is just part of a sense of human dignity and everyone deserves to have good, healthy food to eat. And like Alice said, when resources are scare, scarce, fresh fruits and veggies are often the first to go. And just look at the nutrition there. Like you can just see the vitamins and minerals, right? <laughs> at just, that is so healthy. And those are the foods <laughs> that are expensive and that are not shelf stable. But guess what? They are the very things that you can grow in your own backyard and in your community and with a buddy and that you can share. Um, we're going to start off by talking about some of the benefits of growing food. Um, I don't know, Alice, do you want to? Um, yeah, so our first thing is that uh, fresh grown, homegrown things are more nutritious. Um, and so here's, yeah, these pictures, most of the pictures in here are from the Mustard Seed Community Farm. Um, this was actually one week's box. This was a box that all of our volunteers went home with and also that we delivered to many houses. Um, but this was Amy's point, I didn't realize, I didn't think about it, but garden ripened vegetables are, uh, have more nutrition because they, they were allowed to grow to their full maturity before being harvested. Um, and also they're fresher. So um, yeah. yeah, foods will lose some of those nutrients with time. So if you can eat them fresh out of the garden, you're going to get more of those nutrients. And uh, something that Ajay said, you know, Iowa has some of the best soil on the planet and we can grow some of the most nutritious foods on the planet in the best soil on the planet, which is in your backyard. So some people think about superfoods that are grown far away lands. 
me tell you what, you can grow superfoods in your own yard and dark leafy greens are among the best. And so we're gonna, as we go, we're gonna talk a little bit more about leafy greens. They're kind of underappreciated here in the Midwest, but we want you to leave here a little more excited about them. But there's some other reasons that you might wanna consider gardening. So gardening is good exercise for one. There are studies that say gardeners get better sleep. I'm thinking this critter has been helping keep maybe the mice and rabbits out of the garden, <laughs> which is helpful. Um, gardening fosters emotional well-being. And so there are studies for all the wild claims that we're getting ready to make here. And if you're interested in learning more, I've got a little clipboard. Give me your email address and I'll send you the links to some interesting studies. But I encourage you to be your own experimenter and just test some of this for yourself and see if being out in the garden doesn't help you. Um, it can help reduce depression, anxiety, stress. It can help improve your cognitive function, just general health, your self-esteem, your sense of agency, and that means taking control of your own life and your own food, and it can enhance your sense of community. All of those things are super important for well-being. Go ahead, Alan. How does it improve your cognitive function? I want, that's a really interesting question. And studies are showing that they do. I don't know if it's um, encouraging you to plan and um, think about things three-dimensionally and differently, or if it's just exposure to the sights and sounds and various stimuli that are in the natural environment. We spend an awful lot of time indoors and we don't have that kind of mental stimulation that you have outdoors. Um, I just, again, so our farm, we have this community farm and um, twice a week, there's a lot of people that come out to the farm. Um, we, we gather, we share our names, um, we sign up for vegetables and we, we go out and harvest all the vegetables that are ready. Um, we bring it all back. We have this little crew in the pack house. Um, we bring them the vegetables. Here's here's a, here's a some of our folks in the pack house. This is kind of the end of harvest when we start picking flowers and we make flower bouquets to bring to people. Um, and then at the end, we have, a, again, we gather in a circle and we all kind of share, um, you know, our, our highs and lows from the morning. And um, there's just a, it's, it's a wonderful time to be together. And there's a lot of people who are just sharing that, um, just the emotional well-being it brings to their life, to their time on the farm. Um, and um, just, you know, this is a calm time in, in my in my week. This is, I look forward to this. This is my, my therapy. This is, um, I just like can let go. It's so great to be outside. Um, and I, I feel so grateful that I get to live a life where I get to work outside every day uh, if I want to. And um, right this past few months, I've not been so grateful. It's been a very <laughs> cold, windy, damp spring. Um, but even then, I, I, I'm excited like being outside um, gives me joy. Mm -hmm. um, being able to just encounter nature, to, to watch the birds migrate, to have my hands in the dirt, and um, yeah, to, to, to care for plants and watch those little seeds grow into these amazing things. Yeah. So Alice, you know, in Japan, they practice something called forest bathing. And that doesn't have anything to do with taking off your clothes and taking a that's, shower. That's what forest. I thought. <laughs> what it is, is it's just allowing yourself to sit in nature and savor the experience. You know the way you can savor food and kind of roll it around in your mouth and think about the textures and the flavors and maybe even the origin of the food and practice gratitude. You can do that same thing in your mind with experiences. And you can sit in nature and you can listen to the birds and just think about their sounds. You can watch the, uh, the leaves rustling or the wind rustling the leaves. And in Japan, they recognize that these are good things for heart rate, for blood pressure, just for a sense of calm. In fact, it can affect something called heart rate variability which is a, a measure for heart health, but also just kind of the um, 
the tone of your autonomic nervous system. And it can help bring you out of states of fight and flight or even shut down into a ventral vagal state that feels more calm and connected and safe. And it, it's really kind of magical how uh, nature, just allowing yourself to sit in nature and fully experience it in the moment can change you on a physiological level. And you know, it occurs to me that Gardening can also contribute to relational harmony. I have a little story. My daughter and I homeschooled for a while when she was in elementary school. And there were moments, it might surprise you, Alice, that things got tense. Um, and we had a garden in the backyard and our daughter helped plant it and helped manage it. And so when we were starting to get a little bit frustrated with each other, we'd say, let's go check on the garden. We'd give something a little water. We'd give something a little love. We might see a garden spider, might find a caterpillar, and then we'd come back inside, brand new people, um, not at all uh, upset with each other and just ready to tackle the next thing. I don't know how nature does that. I don't know how gardening does that, um, but it did for us. And uh, I just find the relationships that we build when we're getting our hands dirty, weeding the garden beds, um, having good conversation in a relaxed way, uh, it really builds community and builds relationship. There's something really important about experiencing awe and wonder for your emotional and physical well being. And for me, the garden is the most reliable place to experience awe and wonder. Right now in my garden under grow lights are all of these little baby plants. And it's hard to believe, but they all started with a seed. And they take, the seed takes water and light and air and minerals, and it creates things like tomatoes and peppers and eggplant. And that, blows me away. Every day, I go take care of my little baby plants and they inspire me and they create a sense of awe and wonder. And I think that makes me a better and more compassionate person. I think you better. <laughs> <laughs> here's our next awe and wonder slide. So here, if you can tell, so here's our, our harvest crew and I'm, uh, they're looking out with awe and wonder at, um, what is now, uh, um, these are kind of halfway grown kale plants and cabbages. So those those little those little tiny things you saw on the last slide were little brassicas. I think they might have been cabbages. But here we have more full grown and, um, and and again, when our kale gets full grown, it's usually like this high. It's pretty crazy how those little tiny things can grow up to such a big thing. You know, if you harvest your kale properly and you you keep that growing tip going. Um, you can start harvesting your kale early spring and I've harvested kale in November from the same plant. You just keep it going. You don't harvest from the very top and it's a, one of the most sustainable plants ever. It's pretty magical. And, and yeah, so just a little tangent. So we, we have these little kits back there. There's four little plants. It's sort of like the spring version of our garden kit. So there's a garden kit booklet which is talking about 10 plants. And um, you're not getting those 10 plants because it's too early to plant them. But it's it's a great time to plant the four that are there. Um, but the idea about this kit is not, not necessarily that it's going to make enough food to just like feed your whole family all the time. But it's these are plants that are going to grow really reliably, really well here in Iowa. And they're going to give you a little bit of food every day. And that's a cool thing about the greens, about the chard, about the kale. And also there's a broccolini plant. Um, and each of these things, like you don't just harvest it once, you can just keep harvesting. You can harvest like one leaf, you know, you know, I don't know, maybe one leaf every day, but you can just a little bit at a time, the plant's gonna keep growing as, and you just don't, yeah, don't harvest the, the tiny top part, but just a few leaves and you can chop them up and put them in whatever you like to cook and just add a little bit of extra nutrients, extra fun to your regular meal. Um, so, so that's just kind of bringing those those greens back in there. Absolutely, yes. 
So why would you want to grow your own food? A sense of agency, having control over your food system, knowing where it comes from, but being able to provide for yourself. That's pretty powerful. I think you can kind of see that in their faces. Yeah, like why would you want to go out and harvest beets in the rain? Because you feel so powerful. Because <laughs> they're so beautiful. And gardening with a buddy is going to build your sense of community, which we think is super important. Um, working to, together toward a common goal um, can be very fulfilling and can be really fun. They look like they're having a blast. Um, yeah, here just. Um, yeah, the sense of the sense of being part of something bigger than yourself. I mean, for me, that is something that keeps me going is it's yeah I can feel lonely I can feel isolated and it's so exciting to feel like I'm working with this team of people we're working we're we're gathering food for each other but also for our whole community um and it's just it's just a powerful thing to feel like I'm part of something bigger absolutely here we go more community and why would you want to grow your own food Everybody knows that the food you grow tastes better. Is it um, Guy Clark and John Denver said only two things that money can't buy, and that's true love and homegrown tomatoes. <laughs> you know that's true. And it's not just the tomatoes. It's the cucumbers. I tell you what, at Mustard Seed, they grow the ugliest, longest cucumbers that are so incredibly good. Never had a cucumber like that. In the grocery store. Yeah, Ajay would say that they were unmarketable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unmarketable and very delicious. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and and you can grow varieties yourself that you're not going to find at the grocery store, and uh, it's just pretty cool to be able to do that. Also, when you grow your own food, you're more in touch with seasonality, and I think seasonality is really important for number of reasons. One, I think our bodies kind of expect seasonality. They don't want to eat the same thing all year long. Um, animals in the wild, um, you know, deer, for instance, if you feed deer leaves when they're supposed to be eating bark, they don't do very well. Um, but also seasonality brings you more joy. And that's because of something called hedonic adaptation. And hedonic adaptation is what happens when you have a good thing that sticks around. It's really great at the beginning and then it just becomes normal and kind of boring. So the things that you get the most joy from are those things that have the good sense to go away for a while and then come back. And that's what seasonality does. So when asparagus comes in the spring, it's just magical. If you ate asparagus all year long, it wouldn't be magical. But the thing about seasonality is every season there is something new and magical that you get to really enjoy and invest in in that time. And I don't know if you want to kind of. Well, the other thing I think that's exciting about seasonality is that you get to encounter a lot of new things. Um, I think that. Um, so I think you might notice there's some things on this list, like maybe you don't eat a lot of green garlic or lovage or um, lemon sorrel um, or um, green onions or green garlic. Um, so I think I think that's very fun is the challenge of seasonality, but also it, it in May there's not a lot of things growing um, unless you start being more creative and you can make some just one, they're just fantastic things. Right now, the, the stinging nettle um, is starting to grow. There's not much growing yet, but the stinging nettle is starting to grow, and it is so nutritious, so delicious. And, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be eating it. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have even known I could eat it and that it was so good for me if I wasn't kind of challenged, challenged by the seasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the spring, you're going to see a lot of the color green. Yeah. And then it will change. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about eating with nature. Strawberries. That's an exciting thing mm -hmm. in June. Mm -hmm. It stretches your creativity. Maybe that's what helps make people smarter. 
Maybe that's, that helps your cognitive functioning. Right. <laughs> August is when all of your um, tomatoes and sweet peppers and summer squash and all of those kind of traditional garden vegetables are, are coming Melons. In. Yeah. Yep. All right. So here we are again in August. Sorry, I put a lot of these in because I thought they were fun. They are amazing. <laughs> And now we're going to start talking about cooking, Alice. And I contributed, she says from Amy and Alice, I contributed a few recipes, but Alice did all of the lovely artwork. A um, lot of amazing resources here for cooking greens. Alice, you want to kind of talk about how you like to cook greens? Well, so yeah, I, so what, what I want to go back for a second oh, to no, just sorry. that one, that cooking food is fun. And again, I have this strange communal life and in the summer I we have interns that that learn about growing food but they also learn about cooking food and they're learning about some of them are learning about cooking food for the first time some of them are just learning about how to cook food that's in season with like fresh vegetables um but I, I think it is really fun for me to watch people um yeah kind of their their appreciation of vegetables grow as they're learning to cook and their appreciation of cooking grow as they grow as they grow their vegetables and their you know, just kind of that cycle of like everything being um, sort of, yeah, this sort of positive cycle of everything being more healthy and more delicious and more fun. Um, and yeah, and part of it's because it's, you get to learn things together. Yeah. And I guess I was skipping too far ahead because we do have this slide. Why would you want to cook at home? It's so easy to just go through a drive through or pick up convenience foods. And the thing is, home cooking is just almost, almost assuredly healthier. It can be very simple. I know as a health coach, I get a lot of people who are very motivated and they wanna be really healthy and they start out really motivated anyway, and they want to make all these new recipes. And that's exciting, but making new recipes takes a lot of time and it can be discouraging. So definitely try new recipes when there's a special time or when it's a weekend or when you feel particularly inspired. But eating healthy, fresh food does not require recipes. You just need some basic techniques like roasting or sauteing and steaming and you need some different seasonings. You know, maybe you have some different seasoning mixes. Maybe you use some fresh herbs. You can make things taste different. A, a little bit of ghee or olive oil can help really bring the bring through the flavor of some vegetables, but it does not need to be fancy. And in fact, sometimes it's the most simple preparations with a little salt and lemon and olive oil that just really tastes amazing. And I just encourage you, you know, have have your protein and have your veggies and make it simple, make it easy, involve other members of your family and cutting and chopping. Um, it can be fun, it can be healthy, it can be mindful. If you're just, instead of letting your mind think about all of the troubles of the day, just, you know, think about these carrots and how they grew and who you're sharing them with and the color of the carrots and the texture. Um, think about, it can be loving, think about the people that you're preparing this food for and how much you care about them. And it can be creative. And I would say food is something you can take risks with because what's the worst thing that could happen? <laughs> it goes into the compost pile, but it probably <laughs> won't, right? It's probably gonna taste good, but if it doesn't, it's food, it's okay. And yeah, I just want to say also that this thing about food, like this idea of mindful and loving cooking, um, I also think about that as being really self-loving and that um, just that, that act of taking the time to, um, you know, just to be present in your body and present with your food and to be thinking, one, about how like you are making something delicious and nutritious for people you love but also for yourself and just that like that it's it, it is an act of care and um yeah and just an enjoyment of, of a good thing and and i the person i live with um 
may is he's a fantastic cook but he really he really just likes the taste of 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 the thing you know so he he doesn't put he doesn't like to cook fancy things he really likes to taste the peppers the the carrots the you know and we grow a lot of vegetables and so and they taste really good so it's i think that that's also just lovely to be to be present with the vegetables and, and their own flavors it doesn't have to be anything really fancy and um and and amy did in that in this handout gave some like real nice detailed recipes about how you would use kale especially because i think kale is sometimes intimidating to people partly because it's a little tougher and harder to chew um but for me i i don't usually do like a whole kale recipe i would just have a little bit of kale in my regular recipe i would have a little i would you know i would chop it up put it in my omelets or like um you know just add some vegetables to my stir fry so i would say you you don't have to feel like you have to change the way you cook to just add a little bit of new vegetables to your recipes mm -hmm. also the the two salad recipes in here the massaged kale salad why would you massage kale it sounds kind of weird it's because <laughs> By the time you get to the end of the salad, you don't want your jaws to ache. And so truly, you, you put some salt in there so you have a little bit of grit and some acid, um, maybe lemon juice or vinegar, and then you just get your hands in there and you massage it and it breaks it down and it makes it really delicious. And it's not such a chore to eat it, but it really tenderizes it and makes it wonderful. The other recipe um, is a shredded kale salad. And you're gonna want to, to take the kale and kind of roll it up and then cut it in like chiffonade, like really thin shreds. And that will do some of the same thing there. And then you're adding some acid too, which will also kind of help soften it and break it down for you. And it's, it's amazing, you know, please give it a try. Um, you might be surprised. I also put this little illustration I made of like uh, stripping the kale leaves off of the stems. Um, and it's so fun and it's so easy, just like, and they just come right off. And, um, and I and it says right here, stems are great in soup. Um, this is my personal thing. I, um, I, I have these, these younger people that are learning to cook and they, they don't chop things up very much and they, they put the stems in there and they don't necessarily cook things always as soft as I like. And, um, and, I, and I just, um, I'm a little bit older and my teeth aren't as, uh, as great as theirs. And so, um, you know, I, anyway, I just, so some of you might suffer in the way I do, where you might have had kale and you're like, this is so much work and it's so tough. Um, so that's my tip mm -hmm. is, you know, put those, the harder stems also charred sometimes, put those stems in the soup, let them cook longer, but the rest of the greens don't need to cook very long. Right. And, and speaking of the stems, if you're going to make one of those salads, please, if you're not growing your own kale, buy the whole leaf kale and remove the stems. If you buy the the bags of kale that's already chopped up, it's going to have big old pieces of stem in there, and that's not going to be good in your salad. So um, if you do it that way and don't like it, it's not my fault. I told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, what, I think, what's, what's yeah, next? what's next? Wow, how, what's the benefit of eating local food? Yeah, and, and right, and, and the, this is kind of, remember we were talking about growing, cooking, eating, and sharing. So here we have eating and sharing. Um, and this is a lot of food that also that we grew. So, um, yeah. So, yeah, eating food obviously nourishes us physically. A lot of us, though, end up eating by ourselves. We eat in the car on our way to work or on the way home. We eat in front of the TV. And, oh, gosh, what a waste. Because sharing a meal together is such a beautiful thing. So I encourage you as often as you can to enjoy your meal with another person in conversation and in community. Um, invite your neighbors, have extended family gatherings. The worst of the COVID thing is over, right? So we can gather together again and we can eat together. Um, and, it's get, to talk about. and it's getting warmer so we can have more picnics outside together. Um, but yeah, I think something that for me is really important is this connection of, of food with 
with our culture and with our like with our our own memories, but are also our ancestral memories and our cultural memories. And just like that, that throughout so many cultures, the sharing of food is is kind of this an extension of family. It kind of a welcome to our family. Um, it, it is just a way. It, it, I just think it really transforms our relationships. And I think, um, again, like we, we grow a lot of food and we share it in a lot of ways. Um, we, we give food to food banks, we give food to people directly. But I think sometimes that when we actually just share a meal together, I think it shows more that, that we are equals, that we care for each other, that we, um, we want to know each other. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's just a very profound thing. And, and it does, it recalls to us, you know, like the taste of things recalls our memories. And, we, you know, it makes me think of my grandma, you know, and it, anyway, just it, it, it is very powerful. You know, food is not just its nutrients. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so the, some of the things that give me joy, um, I, like I said, I, I get to have this life of living outside and sharing food with people. So yeah, those things give me joy. Um, also sharing beauty. Um, we definitely try to make our farm a beautiful place. We also try to invite people people in, but also um, send out a lot of beauty, send a lot of flowers and also beautiful vegetables. Absolutely. So this is how our farm tends to share our food. We have um, workers who come and, and help on the help harvest and they will go home with some food and then other food. Um, is donated to farm to clinic, direct to to families um, who could use it, food pantries, shelters and soup kitchens, um, and some of it, of course, is eaten right there on the farm. Um, and here are other ways, ways that you could share food. If you have a garden and it produces more than you can eat or share with those that you know, um, plant a row, food at first, Bethesda food pantry, um, and your neighbors are good places to start. I don't know if Alice, you wanna? Yeah, so, and, I, and I, again, we would love to help you like make these connections, but also again, so there are a lot of people who don't have access to gardens and it might, that might be you. So there's also community gardens in our town, but, and some of them are like run by the city of Ames, but some of them are little, these little local community gardens, people have space to share with some more people in their neighborhood. So just think about that also. Is there somebody that's a neighbor to you that might wish they could grow or maybe help you in your garden for some food? Um, you know, just, but the plant a row is a, is a cool, um, it's, it's a cool project where people with excess food from their garden can, I think, I don't know if there's drop off spots or, but it's kind of coordinated by Ryman Gardens location, but I, I I don't totally know how it works because we don't do it that way. We we have a lot of food, so we just deliver directly to all the places. But if you have a little bit of food, you can take it to them and they will deliver it to the food pantries that need it. So they're they're pretty cool partners. So as you are sharing and uh, exercising your generosity, remember that it's equally important to receive graciously others generosity also that we are all interconnected. We all have ways that we can share with others and we all have ways that we need others to share with us. We are all interconnected. Um, and it's, it's really important for us um, to remember to place ourselves in, in multiple places in, the, in this web of interconnected community. Um, is there anything else you wanna say about that? Um. Well, I, I, I totally missed what you just said. I was okay. Gonna... <laughs> We're just talking about. <laughs> so I, I would look to these notes okay. for a second and then, because I was, yeah, I was going to well, say this thing, but I think you might've just said it. So. Yeah, well, I know. I mean, you could say it also. I know this is also really important to you that we, uh, we want, we strive to be very generous, but we also recognize that we need to be um, generous in receiving from others. Yeah. Um, than that every everyone has something to give and everyone has something they need to receive. That was what I was going to say. Amy. All right, there it. we go. Um, so we get to talk about the plants and the, the plant kits that Alice grew. Yeah, I can do that. So um, here, here's a, so 
so like I said, if you if you hang out with us, so in, in like about a month on May 14th, we're going to have a, a plant and seed sharing event um, downtown in Ames at the Romero House. Um, and we will have the full garden kits available then. Um, and then also it's it's a really fun event. People can bring any plants they have to give away and they can take home other ones. Um, but right now we're giving you just four plants because it's April 19th. And it's and it snowed yesterday. And it's cold outside. I would, you know, and and you know, Ajay was saying that you, you know, these your transplants, you should harden them off and have them outside for five days. You know, we usually our plants, our plants are pretty tough. They get a lot of hardening off at our farm, um, but they haven't. It's been so cold. They've been in the greenhouse or they've been in our house every day. We take them in the house at night and we bring them back to the greenhouse, and they have. I mean, they've had some suffering. They've been kind of cold, but they have not been out in the wind. Um, anyway, so you might, and it's the ground is still probably cold. You might want to actually wait five days or like force them to suffer for five days, rub them. I, I, that was a new thing. <laughs> um, I, I've never done that. I just take them. I just put them outside in the wind, and that's the that's the hardship they get before they get planted. But um, anyway, so you might want to wait, but. On a regular year, this would be a perfect day to plant them. It is going to rain tomorrow. Um, it, they would love it. We have some nice temperatures coming up, but then we have some more cold temperatures. So I don't know. D don't wait too long. Um, I'd say if if you are going to wait a longer time with these plants, they need sunlight. They need um, they need to. They're pretty well wet, so they need to kind of dry out, but then they need to get watered again. Um, so, but you also could just plant them in the ground. And um, we have instructions for planting in here. Um, and so we have a little map of how much space they might want. Um, Did you want to talk about differences like some of them? Yeah. So the, there's four plants. Everyone has one kale, one chard, and one broccolini. And then there's something else. And it might just be another chard or another kale, or it might be a chive. Um, so those are your choices up there. And we'll be up there to also help you and kind of talk to you if you want. Um, but all of them are really fun. And you, anyway, if, but you also, sorry, there's so much I want to say about planting things. <laughs> Aja did a great job, but I also say before you just start planting things, you need to make sure you have a fence um, and that you're not going to plant. These are, the deer and the rabbits love these things in this kit. Um, so if you just plant them and you don't have a fence, um, they're just going to disappear. So, um, so do take the time to have a fence. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So, uh, was there anything else that I I might have gone through the slides fast? I feel like that there was anything I didn't give you the chance to say. We got a couple minutes, and so we're going to want to take questions. Let's do questions. Okay. Um, we I would love questions. Uh, yeah. And about about anything. Have you tried uh, Kaylin Power for uh, acid insecticide? I didn't think it would work at all. I tried it, and the apples were pretty much worm free. Yeah, I I tried it once, but I um. You should ask Ajay that question. <laughs> yeah, so, so we do use it uh, at the uh, at the meat station. It gives the transplant and the kaolin clay solution. And uh, uh, for this kaolin clay, does it, it, it has this uh, clay coating on the transplant of the plant. And when they feed them, they come and chew on it, they don't find it appetizing. So they would go somewhere else. Uh, uh, so you have to uh, uh, do it on a regular basis if that's the only way you are managing your pests. So, we, uh, so depending on the rain, we might spray every five days or every 10 days. Uh, and if we spray, uh, the backpack sprayer which we use has to be agitated all the time because the clay will otherwise settle in the nozzle. Uh, but it's a, it's a great tool uh, as an organic pest management because uh, it also helps with reducing uh, uh, heat stress because the white coating reflects some of the light. Uh, so uh, the answer is yes, you can use it and, and it works, especially for the cucumber beetles. Yeah, I think it's really cool. I just haven't figured out how to like how to practically use it at our scale um, without like clogging our machinery or so yeah I haven't just yeah I just haven't figured out how to do it well. 
I love the pictures which you showed. Uh, wonderful pictures uh, of you know volunteers and working. Uh, how often do you have these community dinners? Is it like once a month where everybody comes together? You all cook together, eat together? Well, so that so um, starting at the end of May. Um, we will have lunch together every day. Anybody who's working on the farm that day. Um, but we we might have a community dinner, whether once a week or to once a month. Um, it kind of depends. It was the past couple years with COVID. We were really we really scaled down our public events. Um, but before that, we were having lots of potlucks. Um, or, or yeah, we have we have public classes, we have workshops, we have discussions. Um, and yeah, so you don't have to just come out to our farm to work. You can come out for fun. We sometimes have concerts and things. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, well, I mean, for me, I feel like an easy way to get started composting is to like pick a spot in your yard and throw things on it until it <laughs> makes a pile. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, I don't know what your concerns are. It might be like it's, you know, it's maybe too smelly or you're not turning it off enough or you're worried about pests. I know um, our friend Steve Libby just did a, a worm composting class yesterday at Wheatsfield. Um, we will probably talk about composting in one of our classes. Um, but I think in this in town, sometimes you sometimes people want to have it in a container so it's not attracting rats and things like that. Um, yeah, I think in in town you can get some bins. The, the important thing is periodically to turn it um, and then kind of close off one pile and then start a new one so that this your original one can finish yeah. aging yeah. And without adding new stuff into it. Um, can I make a comment? Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, for urban landscapes and homeowners, uh, this is about seven years back, I bought a tumbler composter. Uh, you can buy it on Amazon, 70 bucks. 75 bucks. I think the city of Ames also provides incentive. They yep, for they sure. You what, $25 or $30, whatever the amount is, they'll give you back uh, for buying a tumbler composter. And as uh, as you mentioned, you know, there are two compartments. You fill one, and once that is full, you don't add anything in it and start filling the next one. Uh, now the question is, what do you put in there? So vegetable scraps, mostly vegetable scraps. I put, uh, you have to balance the carbon and the nitrogen in there, otherwise it will smell. So you put vegetable scrap, you put some uh, twigs and mulch. That's the brown material that doesn't disintegrate that faster. And you just fill it up. Uh, rotten vegetables or anything you have. Uh, pot, some, some potting soil if you have when you are changing hanging baskets or something. I add a little bit of compost, a good compost also in it as, as a starter material. Uh, and it takes uh, about four months for me to finish that one side, uh, like fully done. And I, every three days I'll rotate it. And I've been very happy. In the winter, the process slows down. I still keep filling it as long as it fills up. Uh, it might take maybe six months in that case. Uh, but every now and then, I, once the four month period is over, I take everything out, spread it in my backyard or in the uh, flower beds. But the tum but the tum tum the composter works really well. Is it something to keep outside? Uh, the question is, is it something which we keep outside? Yes. Uh, you have to keep it outside. Because once you start putting things in there, after some time things will be rotting and it will be dripping. And it's on the deck, it's, it's easy to be so that it's on the deck. And if, if things drip, which means there's a lot of uh, green material, that's when I would add some uh, mulch to it. So that can absorb some of that, uh, that, that liquid in there. But, and it, it's covered, so no, insect, no pest can actually get in there. And it has holes on the sides. So just you can Google. On Amazon, you can put Tumblr composter and you should be able to find it. Yeah, if you wanted to compost inside, that's when you would use something like a worm bin. Um, so you, you can have a worm bin like under your sink. Um, and it's it's also, I mean, this the composting 
concept is really simple and it's actually kind of it's like it's actually the same as all kind of regular life it's a little ecosystem and what it needs is food and water and air um Am I missing something? And so and for food, it kind of wants a balanced diet, sort of like people. And like, so like we might, we want proteins and carbohydrates, you know, and like, I'm, like bees are like this. Bees want to have, they, they want to have a protein and a carbohydrate, so they have honey and pollen. And like your compost pile wants to have nitrogen and it wants to have carbon. So that's like their protein and their carbohydrates. So like what he's saying, like the green things are kind of the, the nitrogen and the brown things are sort of that carbon. So yeah, if your compost pile gets too wet, it's going to get stinky and not go well. But if it's too dry, it's not going to break down. So it just kind of. I mean, I've always have just composted in a big pile um, and just turning it every if I'm if I'm really good every week, but um, and it, <laughs> it goes faster than four months if we do it every week, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, you can leave your pile for three months and not turn it. And it just takes longer. <laughs> I take it you compost your compost your excess tomato plants from the fall. I take it. So we actually we burn our tomato plants. Um, but we do compost almost all of our, yeah, all of our, our plant waste, our weeds, um, our food waste. Um, we also get a lot of um, things from town um, that we add to our compost. Um, we, we mulch with a lot of leaves, but we also put some leaves in our compost. We get food waste from the co-op. Um, we get coffee grounds from town. We kind of, anytime we're coming to town, we usually go home with something to put in our compost. Because we use a lot of compost on our farm, also some um, animal manure from you know from our chickens, from our sheep. Do you burn the tomato plants because of disease? Yeah, because of disease, and I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but yeah, tomatoes definitely suffer a lot from disease. Um, we also burn we burn our cuttings from the grapes and from the raspberries. That's about all we. Um, everything else we compost um, and we try to try and to keep our compost as part of our rotation so um, we have a five-year rotation and so things that might be diseased like our broccoli um, we're going to compost those in that section so that um, yeah so that they're not going to we're not going to use that diseased compost potentially on our broccoli um, so it's hard to keep straight but it, mm -hmm. we're doing all right I don't think we mentioned, but Mustard Seed Community Farm is a great place to do any of the four things that we've been talking about. So if you don't have your own space for backyard garden, or if it's too shady to do to grow the kinds of vegetables that you're interested in and you don't have a neighbor to collaborate with, um, you know, check us out because we're always available for garden therapy and we <laughs> share food. And so, yeah, this is a great place to do any of those things. Um, if you'd like to get plugged in, just talk to either one of us. And there's, yeah, contact. Yeah, and all our, our contact information is on both of our handouts. Um, and also it says gardening questions, ask Alice. So you could um, email me or text me. And um, if I don't get back to you, you should text me. Um, because I do want to answer your gardening questions, though. Ajay, like, it's his job <laughs> to answer your gardening questions. I think. Maybe it's not, but <laughs> yeah. um, it's my job to maybe run a farm. So, but I, I love answering questions. I love helping people learn how to grow food. I did notice you got a very nice website at mustardseedfarm.org. That's right. Thanks. Yeah, we're on Instagram and Facebook too. <laughs> like us on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, and don't forget that May 14th plant and seed sharing event. Um, it will be outside at the Romero House, which is by Fairway downtown. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, real quick, we do have the plants in the back. So if you are interested in using those in your own garden, please do pick those up. Um, the we have a tomato type. Oh, do we have a tomato type? Yeah. 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 Tomato is a mountain fresh. It's a determinate type of tomato. Mountain fresh. Mountain fresh tomato. Awesome. So yes, you can. The broccolini is a different variety than what's listed in the booklet. I don't think I can pronounce the exact variety, but um, Alice, I think, is going to hang out in the back. So if you have a question, you can definitely ask her. But thank you all for coming out tonight. I hope you enjoyed the meal and our speakers.